It's preparing the live stream now. And you're live. It's preparing the live stream now. <laughs> Hello to all as you're coming into our virtual program for the Crow Museum of Asian Art. We want to give everyone a moment to arrive into this YouTube space. So we're glad that you're here. And on behalf of the staff and our very distinguished guests this evening and morning, uh, we welcome you to our Crow space. So we'll, we'll start the program in just a couple of minutes. encourage you to say hello in the chat feature of YouTube. This will also be the portal for questions. If you have questions from the audience during this global conversation. And it is <clears throat> just at the top of the hour. So I will go ahead and begin and welcome everyone to our Crow Museum of Asian Art of the University of Texas at Dallas live stream program on YouTube. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I'm Amy Lewis Hoffland. I'm the senior director of the Crow Museum of Asian Art. And this is our inaugural event of 2022. So it's very auspicious that you're here and we're honored to have our guest, Tozu Nguyen, um, coming to us live from Singapore. It is morning, so good morning to you, Mr. Ho. We're so honored by your presence. And if you have visited the Crow Museum since the 25th of September, then you know Hozu Wen's genius. Um, this was a really um, personally special exhibition for me because I felt so proud that we are a museum that is in this imminent and important urgent conversation about understanding. And I feel a great sense of responsibility in here in Dallas in North Texas that art is an intersection. It is a conduit, a way of communicating um, knowledge and Hosu Wen represents a daring um, artist in the world who is asking us to look at our words and to look at our misunderstanding and our understanding of words and he has studied language um, deeply for many years so I really honor how this is manifested in this beautiful video installation that is at the Crow Museum in Dallas, Texas um, for a few more days. So this, this event really heralds the close of our exhibition, but there is so much beginning as you'll hear through this program tonight. We're also joined by Jacqueline Chow and she'll speak in just a moment. She is our distinguished curator at the Crow Museum of Asian Art, also a lecturer at the University of Texas at Dallas. So good evening, Jacqueline. Thank you. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about this program. We're honored to introduce Mr. Ho. He has not been able to join us in Dallas for all the reasons that you know, but I'm so honored to present um, in conversation with Dr. Chow, a truly celebrated artist with a broad following across Asia and the globe. Um, Ho Zhu Nguyen was born in 1976 in Singapore. He is known as a filmmaker, an installation artist, performances that begin as engagements and historical and theoretical texts. His recent works are populated by metamorphic figures such as the Weir Tiger, one of several tigers, 2017, and the Triple Agent, the Nameless, 2015. Under the rubric of the work that we're presenting here in Dallas, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. His works have been presented at the Yamaguchi Center for Arts and Media in 2021, the Edith Ruth, I'm sorry, the Edith Russ Haas for Media Art in Oldenburg, 2019, Kunstverein in Hamburg, 2018, 
the Ming, these are just a few, but I, I have to list them so that, because of their global importance. Um, the Ming Contemporary Art Museum in Shanghai, 2018. Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, 2017. Guggenheim Bilbao, 2015. The Mori Art Museum in Tokyo. And he also represented Singapore in the pavilion at the 54th um, at Venice Biennale in 2011. Recently, he's also been part of group exhibitions, including the um, 12th Guangzhou Biennale in 2021, the Aichi Triennale in 2019, and Two or Three Tigers at the Haas de Kulturen de Welt in Berlin in 2017. Together with Taiwanese artist, and actually I'm wearing a Taiwanese designer tonight, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but together with Taiwanese artist Hu, Hu Chai Wei, I should have practiced that with you, Jacqueline. My apologies. Oh. Can you correct me? Oh, it's Xu Jai Wei. Yeah. Xu Jai Wei. Yeah. He curated The Strangers from Beyond the Mountain and the Sea, the seventh Asian art biennale at the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts, where I have had the pleasure of visiting. Um, it's also important to say that he has a project opening later in just a few days, <laughs> later this month, in two days. Um, at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and so we'll hear a little bit more in his conversation with Dr. Chow. So um, Mr. Ho, thank you for illuminating, illuminating our experience with your work. We've found it profoundly important and we're so grateful for your daring edges. I look forward to uh, learning more and to the audience, please warm up this room, say hello in the chat, ask questions, Jacqueline and our wonderful um, Team member Caroline Kim will be monitoring the chat and we really want to hear your voices, your words and your language as part of this interactive global program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy, for this for the wonderful introduction and welcome. And just thank you all who are out there. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Amy uh, so warmly introduced me, um, my name is Jacqueline Chow, and I serve as the Senior Curator of Asian Art at the Crow Museum of Asian Art of the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to have this conversation today um, with Ho Tzu Nguyen right here, um, and especially on the occasion of his U, the US premiere of his installation at currently on view at the Crow Museum, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia, which is on view until January 30th. Um, just a bit of background about the project, the Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia is part of an ongoing project, um, as Amy mentioned, that is grows, it generates and provides critical insight into the pluralistic definitions of the territories under the term Southeast Asia. Born out of a recognition for how sweeping the term um, born out of recognition for how sweeping the term Southeast Asia is, the project considers what makes up an area that is not unified by language, religion, or political power. Um, so first, I think for this program, uh, we would, I'd like to begin a conversation with Zhu, and then we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. So uh, please feel free to start ask, thinking of questions. Um, but let's, let's start, I think, first with, you know, I want to thank you too, so much for being here with us <laughs> at this time. Um, and I know it's very early morning for you, um, but I thought I would that would be great to begin to just start um, first by talking a bit more about your artistic practice. And um, I was wondering if you could share a bit more about how you began your journey with creating this, um, the art pieces that you have created. Um, a little side story, actually, uh, to if you remember, I think the first time we met was a project we worked on together earlier on in 2017, which was at the Chrome Museum as well. And it was in partnership with Dallas Contemporary, also with uh, Moving Image Archive Hong Kong. So with Lilia Kudelia and Hitomi Hasegawa. And we and you were so amazing to come to the Chrome Museum and present on your project Earth, which um, the film and the, the making of the project. and. I was so fascinated by how it was, I think it maybe began as an engagement, I think with, his, with history, with theoretical texts. Um, and it really had this, um, for those familiar with the film really has this aura of um, being his, a historical document or, or that reminds me of a, a painting, a historical a classical painting, actually the way it was composed. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the process that you engage in, especially when you're um, looking at as 
you say that the starting point is with critical and historical and theoretical texts. If you could just talk a little bit more about that. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. So before that, just uh, wanted to say hello and uh, thanks for having me here and thank you for all the introductions. So uh, yeah, so just to uh, speak a little bit about the process of how I work. Yeah, I would say that I think a large majority of my works begin out of uh, and my engagement with uh, specific uh, texts. Uh, sometimes they are historical texts or sometimes they are philosophical texts or art historical texts. Um, I would say my work begins out of these, out of an engagement with these texts, not you know, in the sense of uh, <clears throat> an in interest in uh, necessarily in uh, repeating this text, uh, but rather what interests me is my experience of this text. Mm. Um, you know, so for example, uh, a system of thinking, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, manifested in the text, which um, I, I experience almost uh, at the level of, uh, I would say like sensations, you know, so what interests me is how to create uh, a work of art that can reproduce my own experience of this text. So rather than reproducing the text themselves. So I think, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, the critical dictionary of Southeast Asia came out of my experience of uh, engaging with uh, many different types of texts. Um, you know, about Southeast Asia. Wow. And I, I think that comes through so, it really does come through when you mentioned the sensory. I think about the, the, the Earth Project is very, um, se you know, very multi-sensory in the, its feeling. And, and especially also with the Critical Dictionary here at the Crow Museum, it is a very, it is multi-sensory um, with sound, with light, with, <laughs> with all of these other elements, the, the visual. Um, so how did you, I think, how did this idea for investigating um, this terms and how, what the critical dictionary is, how did it begin? I, I know from, from conversations with you, like, I, and also research that I think the project initially started way back in 2013, um, while you were in residence at the Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. And I've seen how um, we've seen this project sort of have many iterations. Um, I know that there was like a performance version <laughs> that was like completely online or um, also this multi-sensory installation that we have now. So I'm just curious to know how it uh, sort of this idea began for you and, and how you were, how you've sort of thought about taking these, uh, create how you went about creating these different iterations. <laughs> sure, yeah, actually I, I think the project began you know, even uh, before I did my uh, residency oh. at the Asia Art Archive, yeah. so I was uh, so I was actually a, a student. I was doing my masters in the Southeast Asian Studies program in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So in Singapore, we have quite a good um, you know department for Southeast Asian Studies. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, I believe I was doing my masters in two thousand. Uh, and four, it took me about three years uh, to mm -hmm. finish that, you know, so, um, yeah, so I would say my, my interest and curiosity about Southeast Asia probably began at that point, you know, when I was doing my master's. And one basic kind of uh, entry level question you have uh, when you're doing your, uh, when you're studying Southeast Asia, is basically you know the very fundamental question of what is Southeast Asia, you know. So I think you already described earlier how you know Southeast Asia in, in, in a way is a strange uh, object, you know, because we don't really know what constitutes its unity, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So for example, it's a, it's a region that has never ever shared uh, one language. Uh, neither has it 
uh, does it have a common kind of like a religious uh, uh, unity or uh, it was never actually also unified by a single political power. So in that case, what makes Southeast Asia a region? You know, what is this line that um, divides its inside from its outside? Mm -hmm. What constitutes the unity of Southeast Asia? So these were you know, kind of uh, uh, questions that in intrigued me already when I was uh, doing my master's. So I think uh, basically when I finished my master's and when I was doing my uh, residency at the Asia Art Archive, I began thinking about this question and how this question um, could be transferred into the practice of art. So transferred out of you know, Southeast Asian studies into an art practice. And I would say what ties them uh, together it's the question of composition, you know, for me. So what is the composition of this uh, entity known as Southeast Asia? How do you compose something that doesn't seem to have uh, unity? Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, these kinds of theoretical questions became for me kind of, um, I would say the starting point of the, the artistic project of trying to imagine uh, the composition of uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. No. Did I... No, that's great. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, just to kind of maybe get a little bit uh, more into the term Southeast Asia, you know, uh, you know, people from the region. Uh, so before, for example, before the Second World War people from the region have never imagined themselves as uh, being part of Southeast Asia. So even the term Southeast Asia itself was not uh, really in currency. It was not used. I would say this term became uh, uh, increasingly popular uh, only after the war, after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So one important factor for that is probably um, uh, uh, sort of a strategic command center known as the Southeast Asian Command, which was created uh, by the Allied forces during the Second World War. So this was an uh, organization that was run by Lord Lewis Mountbatten, um, you know, the British uh, Admiral. And <clears throat> so I think after the Second World War, this term uh, stuck uh, and began uh, circulating a lot more. <clears throat> and that was also the moment when I think a lot of uh, sort of Southeast Asian studies programs were kind of born uh, in the universities, especially the, you know, in, the, in the United States as well. And this is uh, also, I would say, tied in together with the history with post-war history, which is basically the Cold War. Yeah. So I think uh, understanding and studying Southeast Asia uh, sort of fell into that kind of like geopolitical system, you know, of, yeah. uh, of trying to understand Southeast Asia uh, and, uh, you know, which was part of this bigger picture, I would say, of uh, the, the Cold War uh, yeah. in, in, at that time. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's, um, you bring up such a good point. And I think that um, that is so, what you're talking about is so true for so many, um, so many things in just the study of Asian art history in general <laughs> um, and where the research, um, what spurs the research or what spurs the interest in a region. Um, and, and it is very much tied to political interests or um, war <laughs> um, that is, yes. you know, where, perhaps, and I, you know, it's, it's just a fact. It's not, you know, it, it just really is. It's like suddenly there's, in, there's a, if a particular region is interested in another region for whatever other purposes, there's interest in learning more about the region specifically um, that they're, you know, related to war or other political interests. So yes. um, I, yeah, you're pointing out something that's really important, I think. And, you know, it's true. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I, was thinking about with, you know, especially with what I loved about your project too, is that is the research um, that you did. And 
I can, if, I mean, it is so overwhelming in a way <laughs> because there's so many terms and so many definitions and it really feels like they're really, it's not possible to have one sort of, it's not one book, you know, it, it could go on forever. <laughs> and I was curious about how you, um, what was your research process like? I, I think about terms like you're, you're mixing political terms, you know, like topography or hydrology, but also with mythological terms like wear tigers. And, um, and so I think that there's, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you try to structure what, what was your thinking about structuring all these terms sure yeah yeah thank you for the question uh yeah i think one way to to begin answering that question is is also to think about um sort of like my first engagement with the idea of southeast asia which is through you know my time in the southeast asian studies program and, you know, I just want to speak a little bit actually about uh, the Southeast Asia Studies Program, which is, I guess, you know, in, the, in academia, we re refer to such departments as uh, area studies mm -hmm. or region, regional studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as opposed to other kinds of departments in the university, what characterizes area studies is actually the lack of a single discipline. Mm -hmm. you, know, so for, you know, so if we contrast it, for example, with like the history department, right, which is a department built around the core of a single discipline. Mm -hmm. But when you have something like area studies, you, you actually don't have a single discipline. What the core of the program is a, is a location, right? it's a geography. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, so what was really interesting about Southeast Asian Studies program was actually its multidisciplinary nature. So all of these uh, disciplines engage with the study of a single uh, geographical location. So I think from the very beginning, that really in informed my approach to thinking about Southeast Asia, which is to, you know, engage with um, text, um, you know, materials from multiple fields, mm -hmm. you know, and this think this pluralism, you know, this uh, heterogeneity, uh, this uh, it's it's rather unruly, I would say, mm -hmm. and this unruliness, I think, uh, you know, for me, is a sort of a crucial part of uh, the feeling of uh, Southeast Asia, you know. But at the same time, while thinking about these uh, pluralities and these multiplicities, um, you know, for me, I also start to think about its opposite, which is I start to think about its possible unity. So thinking about its unity and its plurality at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. that was always my approach to the dictionary. And yeah. I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's, very much uh, how I think about uh, the possibility of composing this uh, entity, which is Southeast Asia, how it can yeah. be simultaneously unified and multiple um, uh, at the same time. You know? yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so basically ever since I was uh, doing my master's, I, you know, sort of kept uh, uh, notes about various uh, aspects of Southeast Asia that interested me. Mm -hmm. So these sort of uh, notes uh, kind of uh, were accumulated over quite a number of years. And I had no um, sort of like fixed ideas of how I was going to work with these notes. Yeah. So it basically accumulated over the years. And, uh, you know, what we have see here, uh, you know, at the exhibition at the Crow Museum is kind of like, I would say, one of its manifestations. You know? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think everyone, um, and we'll show some images, I think, of the installation of the notes themselves are so interesting. And I, I find that many people will, it's like, uh, will stop and read they will read, you know, <laughs> the, the, the walls. Um, it's just really fascinating. I, I, I did have one thought, I was thinking about this too, um, which is, you know, what, 
and I'm curious if you had any, if you thought about this particularly, but why was your decision to narrate and offer the video in English? I'm curious if there was a particular choice, why the, the choice was made. Sure, yeah. yeah. You know, I think for me, one of the main reasons uh, essentially is uh, pra practical practicality, uh, you know, yeah. so at, just at a pragmatic level, like uh, in Singapore, English is our working language, mm -hmm. you know, so it is not my mother tongue. I'm ethnically Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, probably in Singapore, we have a very strange uh, relationship to language. So mm -hmm. English is our working language. It's like our primary main language uh, in school for education. We are taught mathematics in English, right, for example. So, but at the same time, uh, I've always felt like uh, it's, it's not my natural tongue. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a language that I feel very comfortable in. Mm -hmm. But neither do I feel comfortable in Mandarin or Chinese because I have, uh, you know, gradually been kind of like detached from it. So I would say we are, you know, if language is a kind of a home, uh, Singaporeans are kind of uh, homeless. You know, yeah. we, we have yeah. no natural language. Yeah. You know, so <clears throat> considering all of that, uh, these factors, you know, so uh, sort of working with English is simply um, kind of the most practical and convenient uh, choice. But at the same time, because of my... Uh, I would say because of my sort of inherent uh, uh, lack of comfort with English, uh, <clears throat> I would say this kind of like struggle with the language um, actually, uh, I would say is uh, uh, very important for me in uh, many of the video works that I produce, uh, especially with its usage of uh, uh, text. Right? Mm -hmm. So I would say this is one of the main reasons why, um, you know, the text in the work is sung rather than spoken. Mm -hmm. So singing the text or, you know, having a musical approach to the text in a way frees me from my own discomfort with uh, spoken English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, that's, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting layer that you're presenting too, um, with the language, because I, I originally, initially when I experienced the work and with the singing, I thought it, I thought it was just, um, a part, of, again, another, a part of the multisensory experience. I think it adds the richness where it's like the spoken as well as the singing, as well as the multiple feeds at uh, different types of footage. Um, and also even reading, you know, the, your inclusion of subtitles. Um, <laughs> so I thought all of that was intentionally, but I think that's a really interesting, it is an interesting layer of thinking about language and singing versus, um, and also comfort with language is, is another really interesting point. Um, actually, one thing that's uh, also been really, um, what I found also interesting about this piece too was this element of the lights um, and the and not in addition to this compilation of footage like that you've gathered and collected um, for many years um, there is both this the algorithm that gener that sort of manifests it really kind of randomly in a way um, and also the lights um, at different points people will come just for background for those who are watching people can come into the installation and there will be a burst of LED lights that essentially will wash out the image at random points. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your thoughts were in creating that experience and perhaps the meanings behind it. Sure. Yeah, yeah thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So just to be uh, a little bit more specific, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, in, at the crow, what we are seeing is a, is a, is a projection, is a front projection, meaning that the projector uh, is in front of uh, the screen. So you, we can, in this image, for example, we can see yeah. the projector on the ceiling, right? 
But the screen that we are using is actually a two-sided screen, meaning light can also pass through from behind the screen. Yes. So the sets of LED lights that uh, Jacqueline was describing is actually placed behind the projection screen. Yeah. And these LED lights are actually uh, wired uh, to uh, uh, a system that we call the algorithmic editing system. <laughs> so this editing system is responsible for composing the the video footage that we are seeing, which is projected from the front. But at the same time, these uh, sets of algorithms are also controlling the LED lights, which occasionally flash uh, from behind um, the screen. So these two sites actually are both lights. You know, on one side, we have the lights from the projection and on the other side, we have lights from the LED. Mm -hmm. And both sets of lights are actually uh, controlled or triggered by the same sets of algorithms. Right? So <clears throat> uh, whenever these white LED lights are pulsating, it washes out the projected image from the front. But it also introduces a kind of pulse or beat uh, into the whole space. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a way of activating the entire space. But at the same time, for me, these LED pulses, mm, they almost uh, kind of give direct expression to the algorithms uh, themselves, mm -hmm. you know, to the algorithmic editing system. So the way that we created this uh, editing system, I mean, you know, very similar to how uh, all kinds of algorithmic writing is done, is that <clears throat> it is all, you know, composed of a sequence of uh, numbers of digits from zero to nine. Um, so these, the, the algorithms in our programming uh, will determine how many pulses of white light there will be at uh, specific moments. Mm -hmm. So for me, these white pulses, you know, they, they express this beat from the algorithms in a very direct way. But at the same time, you know, the video that we are seeing from the front, uh, they are also actually uh, sort of uh, composed by this same set of algorithms. Right? So that's uh, you know essentially the structure of these uh, objects. What was this? Um, and this is probably getting so technical. I'm just um, I'm geeking out a little bit <laughs> listening, yeah. thinking about it because I can't. I mean, what was the process like? I know you worked with um, two software developers um, to create this algorithm. Um, and so was it something that you had already sort of envisioned um, or did it kind of come through like um, through your conversations with uh, the two developers, um, Jan Gerber and Sebastian Lucar, um, and sort of this idea to weave together the music, the text, the footage, all of, you know, it was already sort of, it was this idea you had to, to do and they were able to create it. <laughs> or, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think uh, when I was, I have to say that, um, you know, these specific manifestation of the project with this algorithmic uh, editing system, this was part of my residency at the Asia Art Archive. Wow. And yeah, and my residency was like five years. Mm. I, I'm sort of, I think I claim the dubious honor of being the longest lasting like uh, resident <laughs> of Asia Art Archive. And that's simply because I couldn't figure out how to finish this project. <laughs> you know, so I, I mentioned like a, it's earlier a thesis. That, it's another yeah, thesis. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah. it, it, it felt very much like one of these uh, stories that one hears from one's uh, friend about people not being able to complete their PhDs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at some point it did feel like that. So I had accumulated all these notes about all these different aspects of Southeast Asia. <laughs> and I, you know, just uh, couldn't think of how I could create something that could bring all of these uh, heterogeneous uh, notes uh, 
mm-hmm. together in a way that is still kind of like coherent and makes sense. So that's you know the the reason why the project stopped on and the, the residency stopped on for so long, and uh, and then I was invited uh, 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 to Finland uh, to Helsinki to do a lecture. Uh, this was, I think, in 2014. And by coincidence, uh, Sebastian Lutgert, who's one of the two uh, software uh, you know, de- uh, developers that I uh, worked mm-hmm. with, he was also invited to the same university to also present a, you know, another lecture. Mm-hmm. And uh, because we were both guests of the university, they placed us in the same apartment. <laughs> so I started... And at that time, oh, great. At 2000, yeah, yeah, it was great. And yeah. at that time, I had also just moved to Berlin and Sebastian, you know, he's based in Berlin, right? So we started chatting and uh, both Sebastian and Jan have developed actually a very interesting software for working with uh, archival uh, materials, mm-hmm. uh, which is known as OXDB, mm-hmm. uh, OXDB and it's almost a kind of a system uh, that one can use uh, <clears throat> to categorize um, found footage films. Mm-hmm. So, you know, existing films, uh, mm-hmm. it was almost a kind of system where you could divide up these existing films and find ways to, to classify scenes from existing films. So it was a very interesting uh, Wow. Uh, kind of technical system yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and <clears throat> I think just like within three weeks of like meeting uh, Sebastian suddenly it clicked for me that I started to imagine a way to use that existing system that they had developed mm-hmm. uh, to kind of splice it mm-hmm. together with my interest in Southeast Asia you know? yeah and I would also say that this uh, probably was one of my kind of like main approaches to, to this project, which is like, you know, these kind of algorithmic systems, uh, you know, they, they are not something that one usually thinks about when we think about the problem of Southeast Asia, right? Like, which is a kind of historical, um, you know, if we want kind of like post-colonial question, yeah. Mm-hmm. But to take this question and to, you know, kind of uh, splice it like together with these kind of like algorithmic systems, uh, you know, so that was kind of like one of the starting points of this project as we see it now. Yeah. Well, I I was curious about um, actually speaking of the footage as well, like there is, it's so interesting. I mean, and it's also very diverse. Um, I can almost sense you know, some of the videos where you were possibly pulling from, like, it almost feels like there's travel videos, like advertisements or something that you're pulling from. And I'm curious about what the, you know, what was your decision process for what films you were selecting to splice from and where, where, what footage you decided to splice from? Like, was there a, 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 a general thought about, you know, what movies, what sources that you wanted to pull from? Yeah. yeah, so, uh, you know, just also to kind of clarify, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so all, so for the whole dictionary project, we, you know, I think one of the key parameters that I set for myself was n- not to use any footage that I produce <clears throat> directly. So we only work with um, footage that we find online so they are all found footage Mm -hmm. Um, so that was kind of like the only parameter you know so uh, as to what kind of uh, footage we will be find online I uh, intentionally intentionally didn't want any restrictions Mm -hmm. to that so the heterogeneity itself was important that it was also images from a variety of uh, sources uh, so there could be movies mm-hmm. that we downloaded uh, as torrents. Uh, there could be YouTube videos or videos that we find on Vimeo. Mm-hmm. So uh, the algorithm, algorithmic editing system then recomposes uh, all of these uh, images that are sourced online. Yeah. But um, 
you know, just to kind of uh, also further clarify that there is, I would say, one further intermediate step, you know, between the original footage and the final um, sort of film that we see. Uh, <clears throat> the, in, uh, the intermediate kind of like process was uh, basically that I uh, worked with a number of uh, other assistants and collaborators to source for this footage so that I didn't have to do any of the selection myself. Mm -hmm. So this was really an important part of the process for me. Mm -hmm. So with all of these collaborators and uh, assistants, <clears throat> um, I, I, I did a lecture with them. I think it was like a three or four hour long lecture where I went through all the terms in the dictionary Mm -hmm. from A to Z. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, elaborating to them what interests me with these terms and also to uh, kind of uh, produce a series of different keywords around each term. Mm -hmm. So this basically became uh, sort of the guide for these collaborators. And these collaborators then kind of like go into the field, you know, like into on, uh, to online. Uh, to search for these images based on their own understandings of my concepts. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is how the whole archive was built. So um, whatever I saw, whatever you know, I saw for the first time was completely a surprise to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, so, so it's also a way for me to absolve myself of any responsibility for what the <laughs> look looks like, you know. But right. uh, yeah, but somehow this was a very important part of the process for me that the whole work was built through parameters, you know, rather than um, specific decisions that determine how something looks or sound like. Uh, my own role was always to produce parameters that other people could freely act, you know, within the limits of these parameters. Right. And the entire project at the end was the result, you know, of these kind of like these mixtures of parameters and intentions and randomness. Yeah. Well, I think that speaks to the spirit of the project, right? To be able to have... Um, these additional perspectives because, you know, these terms like tiger or jellyfish or, you know, like they are, it's interesting to think about how there's, how it's really, this definition is very much a group, almost like a group think, right. <laughs> of, how, of how they come to be um, and how they become to be understood. Right. Um, and, um, and I think that's, what's so interesting about the, you know, the combination of the video project, the, the work um, and the software, alg the algorithm and how it's combining all this imagery and thinking about these texts, but also the research, like the notes on the walls and, you know, and how do they kind of inform each other <laughs> actually, um, which I think is such an interesting experience, I think for our visitors. Um, I'm just sharing a slide of the index of the current dictionary um, that's currently on view. We included also a listing of the terms that we were sharing also simultaneously. <laughs> and you can see how um, some of the terms that were chosen um, to be discussed and elaborated upon on the walls themselves. So I think um, one of the questions um, I also have about, I mean, is there, and is there a, a hope or perhaps a message you're hoping that that viewers walk away from with, you know, from seeing your work? Is is there one thought or many thoughts that you're hoping people have? I'm just curious if you have any particular particular idea. <laughs> yeah, no. I would I would say that. Uh... You know, you mentioned one or many. Mm -hmm. So probably for me, it's probably many thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's somehow in the nature of this project that it, it's kind of this accumulation of these multiplicities, you know, of uh, multiple terms, multiple concepts from different theories or historians you know, kind of multiple collaborators with multiple sources and types of images. 
so so the project i think you also described it very wonderfully earlier as like you know this kind of group like kind of uh, feeling think, or, or yeah. yeah group <laughs> yeah. thing you know yeah so it's pretty much this kind of like composition with you know aggregates i think of it as like you know working with these uh, aggregates or these masses um uh, and and kind of like shaping their flow mm. so i think f- probably a very important uh hope for me like you know in how uh, the audience like feels is immediately that they feel this mm-hmm. multiplicity you know mm-hmm. they they feel this heterogeneity mm-hmm. um but at the same time that they also feel paradoxically some sense of unity mm-hmm. which is difficult to to describe but mm-hmm. you know so uh maybe i should also kind of like clarify so sometimes when you know everything is uh, made out of multiples you have the feeling that the work is not composed you know everything is kind of like in parts right mm-hmm. so but what interests me is, is the feeling of how something can be whole like one mm-hmm. and multiple at the same time so that's kind of like the feeling that that interested me right that that it's almost yeah. like a paradoxical object that is one and many at the same time yeah uh, so yeah. you know so i would say hopefully like one of the feeling that the audience gets is that like they feel both this multiplicity but yeah. also this um uh, uh you know kind of unity which is like you know hard, hard to describe i think you know i i love that and i don't want to at all frame your work necessarily in this way but that's a very buddhist <laughs> description in a way where you're feeling all, like the unity and also the expanse right um not to say that the work is particularly buddhist or or not um but it was just i'm just thinking in my head philosophically um which i think is really interesting um because that's this concept is very interesting to me too um this unified and then also expansive Um, I thought maybe I would take a minute now to stop share and I wanted to share definitely um, there is a question I thought um, that that has been asked <laughs> um, and I think this is a really good question as relates to the project which is um, has this video been received differently depending on the country or place that's viewing it so has there been a difference in response for instance in the US versus in Asia or in Europe Yeah I think uh, I think you know definitely this this a uh, work that um you know will be understood quite differently depending mm-hmm. on the the region mm-hmm. uh so I don't know yet what is the reception uh in the US uh so you know this being the first time the work is presented um, you know in the states but of course uh, it's it's very different to present it like in Southeast Asia It itself you know so uh yeah. Mm. uh yeah so i think in southeast asia you get like a range of different types of reception you know from from people who are really interested uh, in it mm. to people who also will say yeah actually you know uh you know southeast asians who say that actually we've never ever thought of ourselves still today as being part of southeast asia like for them this right. region is also kind of a uh, abstract uh, construction but when they engage with some of the terms in the dictionary uh, you know some people might start to see things differently mm-hmm. that there is um, you know a different way to connect the region than the political history the post war political history that i described briefly earlier right so mm-hmm. just to give an example like a very important term for me has always been um, tiger T for tiger right mm-hmm. so you know tigers for example they um were dispersed across southeast asia more than 1 million years ago mm-hmm. so this was even before homo sapiens uh, emerged right you know so yeah. at that mm-hmm. time southeast asia was like one single landmass known as the sunda shelf so after the tigers dispersed across the sunda shelf sea levels rose and that kind of like uh, divided southeast asia mm-hmm. so 
you know, if we think to a time before history, you know, before human history, uh, actually, if we think about the tiger as a threat, you know, the tiger ties Southeast Asia together, even before the emergence of like modern humans or human reason, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something quite interesting. And everywhere in Southeast Asia, you still have like, um, uh, you, you still have remnants of uh, cosmological systems uh, everywhere in Southeast Asia that kind of uh, regard the, the tiger as an ancestral figure of sorts. Mm -hmm. So the myth of the were tiger, like shamans who could transform into tigers uh, and vice versa, uh, actually is something that you can find everywhere in Southeast Asia. You know? mm -hmm. So what connects Southeast Asia is the tiger as a yeah. threat, you know, rather yeah. than a kind of a, a, a top-down uh, hierarchical uh, system. Mm -hmm. I would say the only exception to this lack of unity in Southeast Asia, you know, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, as yeah. I suddenly thought of this, yeah. was, you know, we mentioned that Southeast Asia has never been unified politically. I would say there is an exception, which is during 1942 to 1945, during the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, was the only time when Southeast the whole of Southeast Asia came under unified uh, control by the Japanese, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was in during war that actually Southeast Asia was kind of forced like into being one, mm -hmm. you know. So this mm -hmm. is a top-down kind of hierarchical Im imposition of unity, which lasted for three very brutal years for Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would like to just kind of oppose that with the tiger, you know, <laughs> which is a kind of horizontal, non-hierarchical way of linking, uh, you know, this region together. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I think it's a really, it's a really, um, it's so interesting because what you're describing to the tiger as has a role in so many other cultures too, you know, and, you know, I love this I love the research that you made and also like the notes of even Zenghe, like the great maritime explore, Chinese explorer <laughs> who, you know, in the 14th century was also writing notes about encountering where tiger or shamans. Um, and it's just so interesting. I just, I just couldn't, you know, I just love that research. So, and it's just interesting how these other cultures connect through those kind of, you know, through those relationships that are formed when he's exploring and meeting other people and, how the myth continues or, you know, <laughs> the legend um, as it continues and influences other cultures too. Um, so I, we have a couple more questions. Um, mm -hmm. I see someone has also asked um, a, about whether or not this project will ever be available as a book or a catalog. And I think you were, I recall you were working on something, right? <laughs> if you wanted to share more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I, I guess with this project, you know, the, the vastness of the subject matter basically means that I can never really truly complete the project, you know. So <laughs> yeah. uh, using the algorithms to recompose the film so that it's always new is also a way to try to create some kind of con connections that can spark off. Uh, new thoughts or new projects for me. So I would say there is a kind of generative aspect to this project, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, very much for me, the work is also a meta work at the same time. It's a work that can produce other work mm -hmm. in a very different way. It's like, uh, I think So Lewitt mentioned that making art is like, it's uh, building a machine to make the arts rather than making the arts. So there's an aspect of the dictionary, which is like that. Yeah. So definitely one of the forms that we were interested in is to bring it back into a book form. So to, to answer the question. So actually last year I produced a, a book um, and it's called F for Fold. So yeah. folding, you know, yeah. so it's a, it's kind of a dictionary book that can be uh, folded out. Uh, so that's just like another um, sort of like, I see it as another manifestation of, uh, 
of the dictionary, you know, I, and sometimes, you know, maybe for me, the core of the dictionary, the, the true core of the dictionary are simply the collection of terms, like the, mm -hmm. the words, right? So all these other projects like this algorithmically edited film, etc., they are just manifestations or as aspects of, of this project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know, is the book already available? I'm curious. I can't remember. Yeah, the, yeah. the book was uh, produced, I think, end of last year. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, you know, actually currently already being uh, exhibited. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Um, and actually, there's another question related to thinking about as, as you um, were talking about terms and words and just looking back on the selection and progression of the work, um, is there a word or other words you wish you had maybe included? Um, are there more words <laughs> you're thinking about now even? There's, there's always more words, <laughs> you know. And yeah, part of the interesting thing for me of working on this dictionary project is that the, because the work is never completed, mm -hmm. so you are never ever worried that you missed out on something that you would like to include because you can always just uh, include it <laughs> now, you know. Yeah. So it's a project that is, I would say, infinitely updatable, which is perhaps something very much of our times, you know, it's like your yeah. OS or operating systems that you can keep like updating. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, so in, in that sense, I would say it's very much a work of our times. But, you know, I would also say this is a really like cr critical part of the project for me, that it can constantly be updated. Uh, you know, so for example, mm -hmm. you know, so going back to like kind of thinking about Southeast Asia, you know, uh, I would say maybe, you know, I would propose like we can think about making a work about Southeast Asia in two ways. The first is to represent Southeast Asia, to attempt to represent Southeast Asia. And the second way I would say is like making a model of Southeast Asia. So I think there's something different between these two uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. You know, for me to, to represent Southeast Asia, like to produce a representation uh, is to produce something already fixed yeah. and in a way dead mm -hmm. you know? and, mm -hmm. and that is has always been the problem for me of making a representation of Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia itself as an entity it's dynamic it's in time you know it's in history so it's always moving and transforming Absolutely. so by the time you create a representation of Southeast Asia the actual Southeast Asia would have uh, evolved into something else already. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, painters trying to paint a cloud uh, using oil paints. Mm -hmm. By the time your oil paint has dried, the clouds would have shifted their shapes or drifted away, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, then, you know, it, it's important to, to find a way that could manifest or express Southeast Asia that is not fixed and not static. Mm -hmm. And this is why the algorithms come in, because they can always recompose uh, the, the work itself. So this way of thinking about how, you know, engaging with Southeast Asia, I would say is more like building a model or a simulation of uh, Southeast Asia, so a model that can uh, transform and develop in time right? yeah. rather than a representation so uh, yeah so I think you know again that's kind of like one of the basic starting points so it's basically a work that never ends and it's a work that you could always update because mm -hmm. the object itself is always also changing in time yeah I think that's you know I actually think that's very much more true to life and more authentic in a way because I it, it's it's culture doesn't cultural production and culture isn't static right <laughs> you know it doesn't it continues to um, evolve and change and 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 you know it's it's kind of it's infinite as well right and its possibilities um, so I think that that's actually um, I think it's a it's more authentic the way that you are trying to 
allow it to continue to grow in, in whatever way, shape or form it needs to <laughs> naturally mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. And I think that's, that speaks really well to like the present time, right? We're recognizing that the boundaries that we're, we set or impose, uh, you know, don't, they're, they're restrictive, right? And this is another way to sort of express the, the all the infinite path possibilities and aspects um, of, of a project. So, well, I, I'm sorry that we're, we're almost, we're about a minute <laughs> left, um, but um, thank you so much for this incredible conversation um, and just for your time and for creating this work and for sharing um, your thoughts with us today and for making the time to be here today. <laughs> um, this was just uh, so helpful, I think, for many of us um, who have been, who have seen the work, seen your work, and able to experience your work and just adding this have the, this other additional dimension of hearing your voice and your thoughts is, is so important. So thank you so much. Um, and maybe just the last note, I think, is um, we do, I know you are opening a show soon um, at the Hammer Museum. I don't know if you wanted to share a little bit about that before we close. And hopefully those of you who are in LA or going to LA soon can visit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, first of all, thank you for having the work. It's, uh, you know, precious opportunity uh, in the last two years just to be able to share one's uh, work. So I'm, you know, really happy to be able to work with the Crow Museum and, and situating the dictionary within the context of mm-hmm. uh, Crow Museum. Uh, it's, uh, you know, very interesting and very perfect. Uh, for me, you know, so I'm also, uh, yeah, thank you for having this uh, talk uh, as well to, to, you know, open up uh, ways of, uh, even for myself, like understanding and thinking about this project. So, yeah, so about the show that we, uh, I'm uh, about to uh, present at the Hammer Museum, the work is called the 49th hexagram. Mm. So that actually refers to one of the hexagrams from the Chinese uh, book of changes, which is the Yi Jing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, sometimes you, mm-hmm. you, in English you pronounce it as the Yi Jing or the Yi Qing. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of like one of the oldest uh, and I would say kind of cornerstone of uh, sort of Chinese uh, classical uh, uh, philosophical system. So, it's uh, sometimes regarded as a kind of uh, 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 tool for fortune telling, but mm-hmm. it's not actually just that. It's also kind of like a philosophical system. But anyway, that's just the name of the uh, project. And uh, the project was actually commissioned uh, in 2019 mm-hmm. by the Guangzhou uh, Biennale uh, mm-hmm. Foundation in uh, Korea mm-hmm. uh, for the 40th year anniversary of the May 18th, uh, which is, uh, uh, there are many names for May 18th, which was an event that happened in 1980. Mm-hmm. It's uh, also known as the Guangzhou Massacre or the yeah. Guangzhou Uprising. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, many cultural events in Guangzhou began out of this commemoration of this mm-hmm. uh, event, this tragic events. So uh, basically the work uh, consisted uh, for me of uh, a, a kind of archival collection of all the South Korean films that were made about um, sort of the history of revolutions and uprisings in Korea. Mm-hmm. And all of these images were uh, recomposed and reanimated by an animation studio in North Korea. So that's uh, so you know that's uh, one way to kind of like you know briefly explain the 49th hexagram. So it's uh, animation done by a North Korean studio based on um, uh, South Korean cinema about the history of revolution in Korea. Oh, wow, a North Korean um, studio. Yes. Wow, okay, that's amazing. Well, I have to come see it <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I really am curious, I am very curious. I, I saw some stills just from the, from the website, um, but thank you. Well, I'm excited for you and I'm sorry you weren't able to join us here in, in Dallas this time, but 
please, um, please let us know when you are coming stateside. <laughs> we would love to see you. Um, but thank you. Thank you again for this amazing conversation. And um, for those of you who are watching and with us, I know we're a bit over a few minutes over, but hopefully if you are in Dallas, the exhibition is currently on view at the Crow Museum um, until January 30th. So please, I hope you can come and experience um, the Critical Dictionary. Um, and yes, and thank you all so much for being here. And I hope you all have a, a great evening, morning, day. <laughs> and thank you, Zeus, so much.